Good biblical morning. Sorry about that. We're live and I need to pay attention to that because I was busy chatting and in the comments and then all of a sudden I realized our countdown was done. So good biblical morning. We are so glad to have you here. If you haven't been here before or maybe you haven't been here in a while, um, we are a little group called Bible, read along, Bible, read along, hey Bible, read along. I hope that you'll bring a friend. Please bring a friend. Okay, Judges chapter 11 is what we are reading today, and we are so glad that you have joined us. If you missed yesterday, we had Pastor Steve Munns. Uh, Rachel and Matthew and some others from the Kelowna area. You may remember that name, Steve Munns with Go Ministries, the founder of Go Ministries International. He was our guest host yesterday and um, invite you to check that out for chapter 10. He did a great job, talked a bit about his book as well, which is great. So go check that out. Um, yeah, so that, that was chapter 10. Today we are looking at chapter 11 help us share this out. I really, I'm not saying this lightly. I don't understand what, I don't understand Facebook. I'll just be real. I do not understand Facebook. Um, we have a very small following on YouTube. If you haven't done that yet, you can go subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is available. The direct link is available at BibleReadalong.com. That's BibleReadalong.com. Go check it out. And then, um, Facebook, I really just don't understand because yesterday tagging a guest host and the ministry he's involved in should have got more views and we got less. And when we share it out, sometimes we share it out to like 100 groups, we get less views. It just does not make sense to me. So I don't even know what to do. I don't even know if I should tell you to share this out because I don't know if it does anything. I don't understand Facebook. So I think the better thing to do is actually tag a friend in the chat. And let's try that for a while. Tag someone that you know would like to be here or is normally here. Tag them in the chat. That's how you just put the at symbol and type their name. Um, so tag them in the chat and then uh, let's just see. We wanna spread this and keep it going, but I really don't understand how to, Rosie wants the highlighter this morning. Um, I really just don't understand how to make it work. My name is Daniel, by the way. If we have not met, please say hi in the comments. Let us know that you're here. I am here with my wife, Ashley. We love each other. We love Jesus. And we love Celebrate Recovery, which means today we are tired because yesterday was a long day. We were at the at the church late Um but it was a good day, a good group we had. It was a full day. I, I, we, I think we both felt a little bit just kind of, you know, you know when you just feel not necessarily rushed or behind, but it's just like, okay, next, next thing, next thing, next thing. S -s focused. You have to be focused on those days. So we had, I had work. Ashley had some stuff here with Arch. She did some running around. Um, then we had a leaders meeting. Then we had our Celebrate Recovery. Yeah, she's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pastor Mel Mullins, he always says, you know, our bank account's a sign and a wonder. I sign and she signs and I wonder where all the money went. Um, of course, he's talking about checks, which who uses checks, am I right? But um, yeah, we, we got a good, we, we are figuring it out. She doesn't spend all the money. You do a good job, babe, taking care of the house and our stuff and appreciate you. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm saying, so let's pray and let's go to Judges. Let us pray together, pray together, pray with the one, a mighty voice, a mighty voice. Lord Jesus, thank you. Record Peter singing that so we can play it. Yeah, we should. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Just take a minute wherever you are. Just thank him for his word. People died, laid down their lives. This has been thousands of years of keeping manuscripts and translations so that we could have the word of God today freely. Thank you, God, for your word. Lord, we ask for your spirit here today. 
Fill us, teach us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we are looking at Judges chapter 11. Grab a Bible, grab a pen, grab a highlighter. Here we go. NIV version. Yesterday, Pastor Steve Munns was reading from the Amplified, the classic Amplified. Um, hopefully that was good. Hopefully you enjoyed a little different translation for a day. We are reading the NIV, not not even because it's my favorite, to be honest. We're reading NIV just because it's the most accessible to people. Um, it's also an easy read version. So, Judges chapter 11, NIV, verse 1. Let's get into bad names right away. Why not? Jephthah. <laughs> Jephthah. 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 Um, <laughs> Jephthah. That was from Jeff Dunham, if those that don't know the. <laughs> anyways, Jeff. Jephthah. The Gilead, Gileadite. Gileadite. Yep. Was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a whore. Um, you know, this feels like something right out of a movie, but this is, no, it says prostitute. Um, (laughs) you know, this feels, sorry. Um, Jephthah was a Gileadite, a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Sorry. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. (laughs) Ashley's just shocked that I said that. Um. Gilead's wife also bore him sons and they were when they were grown up they drove Jephthah away you are not going to get any inheritance in our family you son of a prostitute they said because oh here we go you are the son of another woman so Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob where a gang gangs in the Bible where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Again, I like just sometimes how these words are. I just like words, even though I pronounce many wrong and I do it bad. I just like sometimes the, the literature of the Bible, you know, so we got a mighty warrior and his, his, his dad was the father of the whole Gilead's the tribe, the clan, the people group, whatever you wanted to call it. And his mother, well, she was a prostitute. We don't really talk about her. And then all the brothers are angry and say, get out of here because you're a woman, you're son of a, another woman. Verse four, sometime later, the Ammonites were fighting against Israel. The elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Now, why? Because he is a mighty warrior. Interesting that even if we have a bad reputation, but we have good skills, people will want to be around us. Um, We see this in business and things all the time. There's famous business people that have had terrible reputations, but they have the skills to get stuff done. So people hire them, use them, whatever it might be. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? So again, and we've all seen this in our own lives and others, you know, oh, now you need me. Now you want to talk. Now you want to, oh, you wouldn't even, you know, bat an eye at me. And now all of a sudden you need something from me and you have to come talk to me. I see how it is. Um, The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. We are here now. Come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jeph- Jephthah answered, Jephthah, Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head, your leader, your master? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. 
And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against me that you have attacked my country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's message. His messengers, when Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peacefully. Jephthah then sent messengers to the Ammonite king saying, so this is, this is pretty typical of how war worked at that time. We're going to go to war, send messengers. They would not kill if it was. If they were reasonable enemies, they wouldn't kill your messengers. If they just wanted bloodshed, they'd kill everyone. But if they were reasonable messengers, you know, reasonable kings, they would accept your messengers and go, what's the message? Well, our king is wondering, what do you want? Okay, tell your king, I want this plot of land. They come back. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, coffee. Yeah, it's pretty strong. Woo. Ha, yeah, ha. Okay. Um, the messenger comes back. Hey, um, this is what they want. They want the land. Okay, go back and tell him. And this is how it works. Sometimes they would even be a day's journey apart. You know, they'd have to ride. Ride. Sometimes longer. Sometimes longer. Maybe you just get in your car or send it. They didn't car. just get in their car. They didn't send a text. Yo. King Jephthah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not, not how it worked. You gonna be okay? I'm trying my best. Breathe in. <sighs> Jephthah. <laughs> Jephthah. <laughs> I'm stuck on that now. Sent back messengers to the Ammonite king saying, This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came up out of Egypt, <laughs> oh, guys, <coughs> I'm going to sit back here. Mm -hmm. it, might not happen today. it might not happen today. We're going to try here. When they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Give us permission to go through your country, but the king of Edom would not. They sent also the king they sent also to the king of Moab, and he refused. So Israel stayed in Kadesh. We've already read some of the history of this. Let's keep going. Next, they traveled through the wilderness, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab, and camped on the other side of Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for Arnon was its border. So here's uh, Jephthah giving them a little bit of a history lesson, because they come and they say, hey, Israel took our land. And Jephthah of the Gideites, Gide, Gideites, Gideonites, I don't remember. Um, Jephthah replies, though, it says, no, that's not quite what happened here, guys. Let's keep going. Then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, let us pass through your country to our own place. Sion, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Little letter. Let's see what some context is here. He would not make an agreement with Israel. He didn't trust them and he wouldn't make an agreement. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sion and his whole army into Israel's hands and they defeated them. Israel took over all of the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from Arnon to Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. Then the Lord 
the God of Israel gave Sion and his whole army into Israel's hands. Oops. Just read all that. Verse 23. Now, since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven out the Armonites, Amorites out before, sorry guys, has driven out the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God Chemosh gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. So now he gave him a little bit of a history lesson and said, actually, we didn't just come in and take your land. Like we tried, people didn't trust us. They didn't want to work with us. And then um, our God gave us this land. If your God is so great, what land has he given you? Now, now we're comparing gods. Now we're comparing religion. <laughs> and Ashley singing, this land is our land. This land is your land. Um, since the Lord the God has driven out the Ammonites before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God, Shemesh, gives to you? Likewise, whatever the Lord has given to us, we will possess. Are you any better than Balak's, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Eshbon, Eshbon Aror, the surrounding settlements and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you. So here's an interesting, you're, you're bringing up stuff from hundreds of years ago. You're also not even bringing it up accurately and you're offended and you want to fight and you want to take land from hundreds of years ago. Instead, why didn't you do this back then? Why didn't you take that land back then? Um, 300 years Israel occupied. Why didn't you retake it during that time? Verse 27. I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. So now he doesn't want to listen. You took our land. That's what we want. And he says, look, we didn't actually take your land. And it's been hundreds of years. Well, how do we do this peacefully? Let's work together. And he says, he's just ignoring it now. No, we are going to war. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message. Jephthah sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from there, he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hand, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. This is kind of a messed up. We're going to see this in a minute, but this is a messed up vow. God, okay, their peace. Okay, God, we're going to war. If you give me the victory Anything that comes out of my house, I will offer to you as a sacrifice. Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into his hand. He devastated 20 towns from Aror to the vicinity of Mineth, as far as Abel Karamim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah, Jephthah sorry, returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised now that the Lord has avenged you and your enemies, the Ammonites. Grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months 
to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go. Interesting times, hey? Like, oh no, I vowed to kill the first person. I don't know why. Why would you even vow that? Like, this is... This is partially where I've had a guy messaging me lately from Africa asking about vows and, and these kind of things. And what does it mean? And, you know, you have to be careful what you vow to God. Because at this time, they kept their word. If they vowed it to God, this wasn't a light promise. This was a, I, I surrender my life on this vow. I have to keep it or I die. So, you know, I vowed to kill whatever came out of my house. Well, who did you think was going to come out of your house? Family? Animals? Like, do you have goats just walking around your house that you thought, when I come home, the goats always run to meet me. My favorite dog always runs to meet Like, I don't know what this guy was thinking, but it's a weird vow. So then the daughter, he's, oh, she's old enough to understand that she's got to die. And she's old enough to understand marriage. So he says, she says to her father, give me two months to go walk around in the mountains and cry with friends. And he says, okay, go. He said, go, he said, and he let her go for the two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. Not because she's going to die. Not because she's going to die, but because she will never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Um, so, yeah, this is sad. Never should have happened. What do we see? We see a mighty warrior. He was rejected. He was brought back because of his skill. Yes, he obeyed God. He's part of an Israelite tribe and working with Israel. Um, you know, he comes, he fights the battle. He vows to God, if you let me win, I'll kill, kill whatever comes out of my house. His daughter came out. She wanders the hills for two months. He actually sacrificed her. He had to. Why does it matter that she's a virgin? Why did you throw that in there? Now, why does it matter that she's a virgin? And why are they even so concerned about her being married? And that's really, the, that's what's brought up here. Because at that time... Your value and your worth, both as male and female, was your reproduction. Mm -hmm. Your value was how many sons, how many daughters, how many, what was your inheritance? How many did you have? So really they're pointing out that they're sacrificing somebody that could have had lots of children. So that's exactly right, hon. They're, they're just pointing out that this is someone that didn't have the opportunity to have many children and you know that could have blessed israel and with her children and they could have been mighty leaders they could have been kings they could have been rulers and we'll never know because she was a virgin and didn't she wasn't married that's really why they're highlighting that um so there you go that's what i get how do we kind of apply this to our own life well i think we got to be careful let your yes be yes and your no be no and this is where the Bible speaks against vows, actually. Don't swear by the moon and the stars and your sons and your daughters and your, I swear by my mother that I will, da, 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 da. Well, that really means in tradition, if it doesn't happen, we kill your mom. And so, you know, instead, don't swear by these things. Jesus even talked about this himself. Don't swear by festivals and moons and stars and instead just be a person of character enough that your yes means yes and your no means no and there is also grace we live in a time too of of you know there has to be grace oh i said here's examples in our own life oh we said we would help serve at church for whatever and then there's times you're just wiped out, you're tired, you can't do it, you're sick, you're, and you got to call and say, you know what, I can't be there. This isn't like a, we're going to kill your children kind of covenant commitment. Um, you know, there is, there is covenants and vows and commitments that you make that are not the same as, let's say, a marriage covenant. You know, it, it, that rips, I'm divorced, remarried, have an amazing wife. But marriage when it is ripped apart it rips families apart it rips hearts apart it destroys god hates divorce and that's in the bible now does he forgive it yes is there restoration yes but 
there's these kind of things where you've made a commitment to something that could destroy everything when that commitment's broken. It will destroy your life. Same here. Yeah, go ahead. So then you should just stay in a marriage? I mean, if you're no. No, so Ashley said she you just people and one of them's like miserable and terrible all the time and just not willing to change anything about that. Yeah. And then the other person is miserable because they have to live with this person that's miserable. Like where do you draw the so line? Is it your story? Are you basing this on no, anything? No. Oh good. I love you too. Um you make me frustrated, not miserable. Perfect. And so I think she just said, you know, so should you just stay in a marriage if you're miserable and Obviously, these are big talks. This is a marriage talk now, um, and that's okay. But that's kind of some of the stuff I get out of this chapter, covenants, vows, skills. But let's talk about this marriage stuff for just a minute. We got we got a few minutes. If you got questions, comments, by the way, to put them in. Um, so with marriage, should you just stay in a marriage if you're miserable? Well, let me say this. Your happiness can change. And your emotions and even your happiness should not override covenant. So if you're just going, I'm really unhappy, there's probably things that you need to change, the other person needs to change, and as a marriage together, you need to change. That might mean healing. That might mean recovery. It might mean counseling. It might mean therapy. It might mean... What if the other participant is unwilling? Now, if the other person is unwilling, again... Yeah, now if the other person is unwilling... You, you do have to look at that and go, okay, where's my character? <sighs> Am I going to allow their unhappiness, their misery to determine my whole life? Or am I going to remain faithful to what a covenant I've made before God and decide my own happiness? And maybe that means some changes, you know, and that doesn't mean, I, I think, let me say it this way. I think we give up on marriage way too easily today and and we have through the bible i mean divorce is all through the bible but i think we give up too easy instead of going i'm going to do everything i can to make sure we're going to succeed people aren't willing to put in the work and even if only one person if only one person out of the couple is willing to put in the work that's going to cause some problems but it's honor your commitment, put in the work, you become healthy, you become happy, you have friends, you, you try your best to make this marriage work. And I would, I would not put it on you to end the marriage. Let me say it that way. Um, even in, yeah, I don't even think with, this is such a, it's a big topic. Let me say it this way. I believe God values marriage. And I believe that marriage is a symbol of our relationship with Jesus Christ. He calls us his bride. He is the groom. Um, You know, there's this marriage. How many times have we screwed up? How many times have we been miserable? How many times have we had bad attitude and God still loves us and wants to work on it and purify us until we make a decision that, no, I'm not willing and we leave. That's how I think we should treat marriage. We should do everything in our power to show love, to find success, to work, to move forward, to bring healing. And if the other person finally goes, no, I reject, we go, well, I did all I could to keep showing love. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's my thought. And I think that lines up biblically. You, You have to decide. I think even sometimes in Christian homes, like we go, oh, you should never, you should never talk about divorce unless there's abuse. And as soon as there's abuse, like if a husband hits you once, you should leave. Well, what about if a wife hits a husband? Because by the way, there is abuse both ways. There's a lot of women that abuse men. Oh, yeah, um, every, every, she hurts me. Help me. She doesn't, by the way. <laughs> um, but there is, you know, there is relationships like this. Should that end a marriage right away? I don't think so. But I think it takes a lot of work. Should addiction end a marriage right away. I don't think so, but I think it takes a lot of work. It's going to take the abuser, let's use that scenario first, to actually get healed. It might mean separation, by the way. 
The Bible actually talks about, you know, you should separate for a season of time for prayer, for fasting, and, and have a set time to come back together. So what does that mean? Well, my marriage is a mess. My husband beats me. Leave. Maybe you both need to go on a two-week retreat somewhere. That's right. I am not... And, and leave. If your husband beats you, if you are or wife, if you are in an unsafe situation, get out now. Don't wait. But that does not mean that you end the marriage. It means you step back, you protect yourself, get into a shelter, get into a safe home, get into another home in the church. And you now say to the other party, like, look, here are the grievances, dot, 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 dot. And you need to change this. So this is what I'm looking for. We are not going to be living together for three months, six months, nine months, a year even. Now, is that a long time? Yes, but it's going to reveal some character. We need to separate and I need to see that you are doing counseling, healing, that you're working on this problem, that you have accountability. I really have a friend who did this. Yeah. And her and he actually left for, I think it was like three months. Yeah. And then, or maybe even six. And even in the time they started like dating again. Yes. So in the time of that healing process, yes, he did all of the things too. Like, yeah, um, they they started going on like dates. And yeah, they were meeting for the first time, getting to know each other again, and going on dates and stuff. Yeah, and now they're they're going strong. And now they're married. You know, people they're do this. Married. They're there are they're married still. There are ways. So she said, "There's a family that did this, separated, and then they started to date again." And I think that's when you set a time biblically. And I'm not a I'm not a paid counselor. I'm not a marriage therapist. I'm just a guy with some experience, and I'm a guy who reads the Bible. That's it. Um, so take this all with a grain of salt. This is not legal advice. This is not speak to who you need to speak to, lawyers, whatever. Um, this is just my opinion on marriage because we started talking about this. But anyways, that's kind of my thoughts. Um, season apart and then how you come back together that doesn't just mean we're going to be apart for three months and then i'm moving back in and i'm and it doesn't mean like you're apart for three months and you're suddenly single and that does not mean you're single you are still married and if you are not working on the marriage that shows other character issues for both parties um you are married like the goal of the separation is to bring healing to a marriage but I think what we end up doing is we go, well, I'm miserable. I've been here. And then all of a sudden we justify and we go, well, I've been miserable for three years or 10 years or 30 years and I'm ready to walk out and, and he's done this and that and blah, blah, blah. Instead of going, did I put in the work and the time to actually bring life to this marriage? Honestly, only you can answer that. Everyone's going to justify and go, yeah, of course I did. They're all in the wrong. If you are fully blaming them and not at all taking any responsibility, still don't do that fully. you're probably not seeing the full picture. There's my thoughts. What? You, let's go to some comments that so here. Random. I'm sorry. That's okay. I love it. That's part of being part of the Bible read along family. We want to learn this, grow in the Bible, Bible based, Christ centered, spirit filled Christians. Let's go to chat. So we are out of time, but I want to see who's here and what we're doing this morning. Matthew in Kelowna, welcome. Rachel's here. I saw Josh um Weeb on earlier. Good to see you. Valentina, welcome. We are so glad you're here. Nice to see and hear Pastor Steve. Yeah, good, good memories. Lots of great memories with him. Hey, Matthew. Karina, good morning. Um, and I'm sorry, my friend here, I believe you're in the Bahamas. I don't know how to say your name. Libertha. Maybe. If I'm if I'm saying that way wrong, please tell me. But we are so glad you are here. Um Karina said peanut. What was peanut about? Jeff Lafaw. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I was like, random peanut. Oh, no. I have a... <laughs> I'm like e allergic to peanuts, and now I'm having anaphylactic shock in the chat. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was jokes, by the way. Straight up jokes. Um, yes, Jeff. Jephthah was a godly man. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Um, 
Ashley was accidentally watching the one from yesterday with Pastor Steve. That's okay. How did he become a mighty warrior? That's a great question, Matthew. How do you advance your skills? Learn, train. Skills that God's given you, natural abilities that God's given you can only take you so far. Keep increasing them, building them. If it's, if it's whatever it is, keep learning. Ashley is a great artist right now, but she's taking an art school because she wants to advance those skills. I'm a decent speaker. Um, I mean, it's maybe not. She's looking at me like, no, you're not. Um, no, she's looking like, yeah, you are. But um, I'm a decent speaker, but there's things I do and have done in the past to increase my speaking skills oh, and work. and to work. And even this, being live every day changes my skills. And I have to look and go, okay, what's working? What's not working? I watch them from time to time and go, oh, I went way off on a rabbit trail there. I got to be better on that. Um, hone your skills. Praying for my lungs. Thank you, Ashley. Ashley also says, this is a weird and sad chapter, and I don't ever recall reading this. Yeah, this stuff, again, this isn't usually Sunday morning sermon stuff, which is great. By the way, I'm not ever against Sunday morning sermons when I say that. We need Sunday morning church. We need to be connected. We need to grow together. We also need to dig in and learn the word of God for ourselves yeah. and how to read it. That's what we're doing here. Um, why do people divorce in marriage? Very simple answer to that. And I believe it was Jesus who said it because of the hardness of your hearts. That's it. So usually something becomes hard, you get shut off and eventually someone will leave because of the hardness of your hearts. It's been permitted. How do you make a marriage work without getting a divorce? Well, same as what we just said with your skills. It takes work. It takes time. It takes commitment. It might take other people. All right. Making it work. Takes a little time. Making it work. I don't know all the words, but making it work. Making it work. Okay. Um, guys, God bless. Thank you so much. If you haven't yet, please go check out BibleReadalong.com. Great website. We got books. We got stuff there. You can link to our Facebook, our YouTube. That's it. God bless. Have an amazing day, and we will see you tomorrow. For more, I will read it all.